and welcome to the latest episode of Rise Up with Donnas. Well, here we are doing something a little different this time. I just thought we're having a new season. Why not try something new? This whole half hour, I want to tell you some things that are happening all around us, both in my life and in our lives. You may have noticed that, of course, the leaves are changing. Autumn is here. And it's cooler weather, and I'm so happy. There's nothing better than autumn sweaters, fall boots, and just the ability to sleep at night with the windows open. Unfortunately, nature has also brought some terrible disasters upon us. Just in the last month, we've had three cataclysms. Harvey hit Texas. Irma hit Florida. And then, worst of all, Maria hit Puerto Rico. And I want to encourage everyone watching, you can help, and they need it. You can go to the link on the bottom of your screen and donate money, donate your time, donate goods. The Hispanic Federation is looking for help. So the way to help them is to go to the link on your screen. Of course, right after Puerto Rico, we weren't even ready to move on. And it was a massacre in Las Vegas. 59 people murdered, 500, more than 500 people wounded. It was the kind of thing where we ask ourselves every single time, what, again? Gun violence in America? And not surprisingly, there was immediately a debate, a debate between left and right, a debate over gun rights. Some people say this is not the time when people are dying, when people are wounded, to talk about guns. Well, it's funny how we always seem to defer the argument about guns, and then there's another one, and then there's another one. Let me tell you one story about why I am hoping for gun control that ends gun violence. In 2012, I was the first person from ABC News to arrive in Newtown, Connecticut at the Sandy Hook massacre. I stared into the eyes of a mother who had just found out her son was dead. My job was, of course, to try and interview these people and get them on ABC. But when I looked in her eyes and saw the devastation that she had just lost her baby boy, a boy the same age as my little boy, all I could do was say, I'm sorry, and stand out of her way. That kind of personal connection shouldn't be necessary for you to care about stopping gun violence. And I'm not saying I have a solution, but part of the reason we have this show is to give you alternatives, to give you ideas, and to tell each other how you can stop the things that you don't like. And for me, gun violence is one of those things I don't like. Is there anyone who wants gun violence? Of course not. The question is, how do we protect our rights and still stop the killing? The problem is, is that this debate has also started something that's just incredibly divisive. It seems that you can't be against racism and be a patriot. The NFL players have been, for weeks now, taking a knee to try and get people to understand why police are targeting African Americans, why police brutality, why racial inequality, why Black Lives Matter. It doesn't mean you're not patriotic. Rosa Parks didn't protest the bus system. Rosa Parks was protesting racial inequality. And that's what football players and everyone who takes a knee is doing. And that's why right now, I'm going to rise up by taking a knee. And I hope that when you have an opportunity, you will too. So Wilbur, what do you think of those people who kneel when the national anthem is played? I think that the flag give us to everyone a right to kneel in front of the flag or don't have to pledge allegiance to that. If they feel unjust, it's done. That's that, what that flag stands for. As long as you don't destroy that flag or do anything on that, then I think- Burning it. Burning it yeah. and stuff like that. I feel though that they guys are right. Basically, I think that the truth be standing and saluting the flag when it goes up, kneeling is not for the flag. We should be proud of our flag and our people at war and I don't know, I just think it's wrong. What do you think about people who kneel when the national anthem is played? 
I really don't got no problem with that. And do you understand that they're saying they're doing it to draw attention to uh, what they say is racism? That's all well and good, except I think that you can probably draw attention to racism by a different matter rather than shooting and kneeling in front of the flag. A lot of people die in order for that flag to be up there. Okay. And I think they should respect that. And not only white people, black people, a lot of different races gave their lives and their times and everything to have that flag up there. And I think that they should respect that. This is divided. People agree, people not. Yeah. So. Some people think it's uh, a protest against racism. Other people think it's un-American. Yeah. But what happened is that, that um, that's because uh, President Trump, uh, Trump uh, you know, they, they know to uh, happy with him. And I was wondering if you had an opinion about the people who kneel at the national anthem. They shouldn't be kneeling. Do you think it's unpatriotic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I think it is a little unpatriotic. We all the same. We bleed the same color, red, right? So what would you do? Would you stand up or take a knee? Yeah, stand up, right? Okay. I'll stand up. Okay. Yes, no. And do you think racism is a problem in America? Yes. Do you think your opinion would be different if you were not white? No. No. But, well, that didn't turn out the way I expected. I sort of thought that there'd be more people like me who would express the fact that it's okay to have a silent protest during the national anthem to call out racism. But instead, it seemed that almost everyone answered according to the color of their skin along racial lines. Maybe I shouldn't be surprised. What's your opinion? Tweet us at Rise Up With Dawn, and we'll post the answers on lifeafterdawn.com. So we're back, and we're gonna change gears a little bit. I wanted to tell you something that has been going on with me for, gosh, about a year and four months. It's what I call my surgery drama. I think one of the most common things that happens when you're transgender is that people want to ask you, have you had the surgery yet? What that basically means is, have I transitioned physically from a male to a female? Now, that's not any of your business. I usually answer that question with, how was your pap smear? What was your prostate exam like? Please tell me. And people react like, oh, why would I tell you that? And that's the exact same answer I have about the surgery. But the surgery I'm looking for is something that's a little bit different. And I went to the only doctor in all of Connecticut that my health care plan, the Husky plan, allows me to see for this particular surgery. His name is Dr. Stanton Honig. He's at Yale New Haven Hospital. And I saw him in May of 2016. And when I went to him, I figured since he's the only one, he must be pretty good. But immediately he first asked me, how long have you been wearing women's clothes? And I thought, well, they're my clothes, so I've been wearing women's clothes for as long as I've been transitioned, which is at that time three years. He hadn't asked me to do something that women generally don't do. He asked me to drop my pants. Now, men typically have a doctor examine them from the waist down, standing up, because that's what doctors do. But for us women, we generally sit in a chair or lay on an examining table, and the doctors then examine us that way. Not Dr. Honig. And I objected, and I said, I don't feel comfortable with this. I'd rather sit on the examining table, please. He basically said, suit yourself if it matters to you, and it did. And then he asked me a question that I've never, ever expected in a million years. Are you gay or straight? And I thought, why would he ask me this? But I was so freaked out, I just answered, I'm straight. Why? And he says, because I'm never going to be able to make you please a man. I won't be able to do anything so you can please a man. Well, guess what, folks? That's not why I'm having any kind of surgery. It's not to please anyone other than myself. I was terribly offended. But I still stuck with it because I really wanted this procedure done. And this was, again, my only option. So I asked him some questions. How long have you been doing this procedure? A long time, he said. How many patients have you seen? He said, many. I couldn't understand why he was giving me these generic answers. This is a very complex procedure. I'm a journalist and I've written many stories about the things that can go wrong. I mean, every surgery has complications, but this one in particular, it can be life altering. 
I asked him, how many complications have arisen from surgeries you've performed? None, he said. Which, come on. And finally, I asked him, well, given that this is so complex, I'm just curious as to who you trained under. And Dr. Stanton Honig of Yale New Haven Hospital told me, nobody, I taught myself. As you can imagine, I left that place in tears. It took me a year to get over the trauma. And to be honest, I'm very glad that I got all those answers because had I found out that this was the man who's gonna touch my body and change my life forever, I would have been pretty freaked out. And that's why I'm telling this story. I've filed formal complaints. I've gone to the state medical board. I've gone to Yale New Haven Hospital. I've gone to Husky. And Dr. Stanton Honig is still performing procedures. And the worst part is, is that Husky won't allow me to go see a doctor out of network. Well, I've been fighting it. I rose up. I had a hearing. And so far, fingers crossed, I'm going to get to see a surgeon of my choosing who actually performs these surgeries under the guidelines of WPATH, WPATH is an international organization that's been around for decades that just makes sure that the surgeons who do these procedures know what they're doing. Not just some guy who puts up a sign and says, hey, I do transgender surgeries. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because no matter what kind of operation, no matter what kind of procedure, just because you have a hangnail, you have every right to get proper medical care. Even if you're getting Obamacare or Husky, you still have rights. And I think it's important that we fight for our rights. And it's important that we not let doctors or medical insurance companies or anyone tell us what we can or can't have. This is a very expensive operation that I'm seeking. And I'm very grateful to Husky that you provide for me to have this operation. But it's not fair that I should be limited to a doctor who I would never ever want to touch my skin ever again. And you know, when I talk about skin, I think about how other people have come to me talking about what my transition did to them. You see, when I came out, I had a setback. I had a medical mishap. I had a seizure. And because of this seizure, I wasn't all right in the head. Uh, I actually thought it was 1999. Um, I developed what they call amnesia. Uh, it was a form of amnesia that eventually was diagnosed as dissociative am amnesia. So what basically happened was I didn't realize that I was trans, I was in denial, and unfortunately that made headlines. And that affected a lot of people. And all of a sudden, detransition's in the news again. It's odd because right now we're dealing with the transgender military ban. We're dealing with violence and attacks on transgender people. And this story that happened to me four years ago, is back in the news, not through anything I did, I don't want it out there, but because the enemies of the transgender community are trying to get this story out, to try and show that transgender people can just switch back. They don't have to be trans. The government doesn't have to pay for surgeries. Here's what I want you to know. My experience was my experience. We have an expression, your mileage may vary. I don't want anyone's life to be dictated by what happened to me. It's not fair that people use me as an example of what transgender people are. I'm not the poster child. Neither is Caitlyn Jenner. What's important, for me at least, is that people should know that change is natural. Life is not linear. I'm not saying that detransition is wrong or right. I think there are people who do transition and realize this is not right for them. If you give Tom Cruise hormones for a woman, he's going to go a little bit crazy. That's not what he needs for his body. If you give a trans woman who is assigned male at birth female hormones, she's going to feel great because then her body is going to match what's in between her ears. So what I'm trying to say here, folks, is it's important to understand the difference between changing our minds or changing our destinies. What happened to me was a outlying incident. It was a one in a lifetime kind of thing. Caitlyn Jenner has not detransitioned. 
She did before. Before she came out, she stopped taking hormones. Before she came out, she went back and forth a little bit. I did too. And you know what? A lot of transgender people do that back and forth. Unfortunately, they don't usually do it under the spotlight of big bright lights and tabloid headlines. That was my downfall, was that it was all over the news. But there's no reason why people should use that incident to hate. And that's what's happened to me. Back in 2013 and 2014, I was a subject of an intense campaign by both trans exclusionary radical feminists, they're called TERFs, and by people in the trans community who just felt that I was an enemy, that I made them look bad. And then of course we have conservatives and fundamentalists who don't think that it's possible for someone to gender transition. The hate I've experienced continues to this day on social media. I've been called a dickhead. I have been called a man in a dress. I've been called a phony, a fake. People make comments about my hair. You know what, it is my hair. I bought it, it's mine. And I don't really give a shit what people think. It's not something that bothers me. It's water for ducks back. But I do worry about other people, especially people who are just trying to get out into the world and be their true selves. They may not have this thick skin that I have developed. And thick skin is what we need. What we need right now are people to be allies. And there aren't enough of you. Not nearly enough. Not nearly. And the proof of that is the story of three young people from across the country. They're victims of violence, murder, and suicide. I want to tell you about Kylie, about Allie, and about Elijah, or Eli. There are three stories that broke my heart. Kylie was attacked by four students, and then more students piled on at her New Jersey high school. She's a transgender girl. Seven students have been suspended. Now, some people say that Kylie egged them on because a cisgender or non-transgender boy mistook her for a girl who was not trans. And that shamed him. Some people even said it made him feel like he was gay because he liked a boy. But he, she's not a boy. She's a girl. What needs to be said is it's okay for guys to like girls. It's okay for guys to like guys. It's okay for girls to like girls. And it's okay for straight guys to like transgender girls. Now, a lot of transgender women I know are lesbians. More power to them. But if a guy who is straight wants to date a transgender woman because he finds her interesting, attractive, whatever reason, that doesn't make him gay. And in typical fashion, this all started a big fight. Now, there's another case. This is a more horrific case. This one was in Missouri. Four people, young people, have been arrested for attacking a transgender girl named Allie. Allie was the name she went by, even though that's not the name her parents called her. Allie was murdered horribly. Her eyes were gouged out. Her genitals were gouged out. And I'm sorry to share these gruesome details. They burned her body. They dumped her in a chicken coop. Tell me, under what right does anyone have that to do to another human being? I'm getting choked up because I just can't imagine someone think that would be a right thing to do. The Mi Missouri prosecutors aren't going to charge them with a hate crime. They're using some justification that it's harder to get a prosecutor a, a, a conviction. Well, it's a hate crime, whether they call it one or not. Allie was killed because she's trans. The last story I'm going to tell you about is one that I just learned about from the mother of a, trans, a gender nonconforming girl. She might be a boy. She might be they. I don't know. We're not going to get to find out because this person named Elijah, and let's say they, no, I guess he, he's better. A lot of people use they because they don't want to have a specific male or female pronoun. But Elijah went with he. Elijah liked to wear uh, women's shoes. Elijah liked to um, wear a dress or see her, himself or herself as something other than what birth sex they were assigned. But Elijah's father, who's divorced from Elijah's mother, he didn't agree. He wanted Elijah to be a boy, and he went to court, and the judge 
refused to allow Elijah, refused to allow Elijah to see a therapist, which meant all Elijah could do was hide, was live in secret, to stay in the closet. And Elijah chose a different path. Elijah hanged himself. He killed himself. He did it because he thought he'd be happier dead than being a boy. He was a victim of bullying. Now there's a pattern of mental health problems in his family on his mother's side, and that's something that needs to be addressed in therapy. I want everyone to understand, therapy is not evil. It's not just for sick people. Mental health is not a stigma, and it should not be stigmatized. It's like, imagine if everyone felt that elbow health was stigmatizing. Well, you'd probably want to see a doctor if your elbow hurts. And if you're hurting on the inside, Mental health will help that too. You may wonder, how do I know so much about suicide? Well, there's a story about that too. This is where our story begins. June 7th, 2014, the Hartford train station. Amtrak services this train station. And I sat on this bench on that day headed into ABC News to get fired. I knew it would be my last day. I begged, begged my therapist to give me a letter that would have allowed me the opportunity to get medical leave. But she said, I'm just trying to avoid being fired. And you know what? She was right. And so you're seeing what I saw. I stepped out onto the track tracks. I stood right here and I waited for the locomotive to knock me down. While I did so, it struck me that I should make a phone call. I should let someone know what I was doing. And so I called my friend Maya. I got her voicemail and I told her goodbye. I didn't say why, I just said I needed to say goodbye. I hung up and just a few seconds later, I mean like within less than a minute, I want to make sure I don't get hit by a train, <laughs> telling you the story. She called me back and I, she asked me, where are you? And I said, I'm on the train tracks, I'm waiting to die. And she said, get out of there. And so I did. And so I did. And I said, I'm going to get on this train. And she said, good. And she said, your life is worth more. Why would you do this? I said, because I'm going to lose my career tonight. Because I've already lost my, the love of my life. Because my life is over. And she reached out to another friend of ours. Jennifer Finney Boylan is a professor of English at Barnard College, is a world-renowned author, best-selling author, and a co-star of I Am Kate on uh, ETV, that reality show Caitlyn Jenner had a few years back. And you know what? Jenny wrote to me the most amazing thing, and it was short and sweet and right to the point. Don't do something stupid. She gave me the number for the National Suicide Hotline, and I called them. But the story doesn't end there. So I called the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. And I'm talking to the young woman, and she asked me, how am I feeling? And I said, well, you know, hello? Hello? And she had accidentally hung up on me. A few minutes later, I got a voicemail. Hi, if you're still there, please call us back. <laughs> Only Don Ennis can have an experience like that. But you know, <sighs> Because I was in a very bad place, I didn't make it to work that night. When I made it to New York City, I ended up in an ambulance headed to Bellevue. That's a psychiatric hospital, and I spent 24 hours there figuring out my life, figuring out what had happened, figuring out why I wanted to end my life, getting good help. I still got fired. I'm not really sure how life would have worked out 
had I not been fired. But the bottom line is, even though there were people who helped me, even though there were people who'd reached out, I was in a place very few of us can relate to, and I want to speak about that for a second. If you know someone who's suicidal, understand this. Nothing will make them feel better except for them to accept that they need help. Because when you're suicidal, you think there's nothing anyone can do. There's nothing anyone can say. There's no help available. The only solution is an exit. And that's not true. Rabbi Michael Pincus told me, I can't promise you that tomorrow is going to get better. Matter of fact, it might get worse. But eventually, sooner or later, it will get better. It won't stay this bad. And he's been right. I'm very grateful to him. <sighs> Getting help was the solution. So if you know somebody who needs help, reach out to them. You might be turned away. You might get yelled at. But be persistent. What I found was the love of my children made life worth living. I stopped looking to others for validation, which is something that goes back to my childhood. That's another episode for another time. But I found in myself a happier person, a more stable person. That's who I am now. That's who we all can be. I think that the problem with suicide is not that we don't understand it, but that we don't know what to do. It's sort of like when I became a widow. People don't know what to say. People don't know what to do. They just feel, and you know that? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Just feel. Try not to fix people's problems and just let them know you feel. You may not feel exactly like they do. You may not understand exactly like they feel. I knew that nobody felt what it was like to be a transgender woman losing her marriage, losing her career, and basically ready to give up her life. But I had help, and I hope you'll get it too. And here's how. Suicide prevention saves lives. There are resources at lifeafterdawn.com for this subject and for all the things we've talked about in this show. I hope that you've enjoyed this different episode of Rise Up Right now, I'm hoping that you'll also want to follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Look up Rise Up With Dawn. And if you do like this on YouTube, like, share, and subscribe. Thanks very much for joining us. My name is Dawn Ennis, and I hope you'll rise up. <laughs>